Hey everybody, Howard Henley here. Apollo 11, an immersive 360 adventure, is a new show that's about to take audiences everywhere on a magical journey through space exploration. And what better way to celebrate the upcoming release than to invite the show's director, Scott Ferris, and former astronaut Charlie Duke Jr. You guys, good afternoon, first off. Uh, nice, Howard. Nice to be with you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with the both of you. It, Thank you. General Duke, I, I got to ask you, well, you are one of very few people that's actually had a chance to go into space. When you're about to take off, I mean, what is going through your mind as an astronaut? Keep counting. <laughs> I don't want to abort this thing. Keep counting. <laughs> yeah, I've trained two years for this moment, and I want to go. Yeah. I'm ready to go. And uh, everybody else in the spacecraft is ready to go. So it's, it's that attitude of keep going, keep going. I'm ready to get my chance. And uh, once it lifts off, you got your chance. I love yeah. that. I love that. Now, Scott, you are the director of this show, so tell us about it. Uh, it's a, a live show. It's not a film. Um, we have a theater that's custom built, 1,600 seats, and the audience walks into this magnificent space. And uh, the show is immersive because the audience is surrounded by 360 degrees of projection surface. And the experience is enhanced by the setting, that environment being um, created around them. Additionally, we tell the story of the space program, but through the eyes of a, a personal view, through the eyes of a grandfather, trying to draw his granddaughter out of her smartphone and get her to look up from the phone and look up at the sky and the stars. And as he pulls her out, he, he tells her his story of being part of the team of 400,000 people that got men on the moon, like Mr. Duke here. I love that. And the thing that I love most about it is that it's not just an ordinary show. It really is an experience that audiences are going to be able to, to enjoy. We hope that it, through the journey of the show, they will be so uh, excited by the effects and the scenic elements and the, the, um, the video projections, etc., that they will feel like they went to the moon as well. So that's our goal. And you're doing uh, 18 cities over a course of two years, right? Yeah, and we've announced our opening in Pasadena uh, on July 5th. We start performances. And then after that, we go down to Orange County, um, to the fairgrounds in Costa Mesa. And then we go to Houston, to the uh, Johnson Space Flight Center there. So and I feel like two years is not going to be enough. I really feel like this is going to extend because so many people are going to really enjoy this. I hope so. <laughs> That's our goal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe we'll be around longer. But we have to create the show, get people to know about it, and, and we appreciate you helping us do that. What are some of the things that the audience is going to learn while watching the show? Well, they'll know that it was, it was pretty terrifying. I mean, General Duke here acts very cool about uh, going into space, but when you watch it as a normal civilian and hear what they went through and, and uh, how tense it was and I think the climax of, of Apollo 11 came down to those last 13 minutes didn't it? Uh, 13 yeah the, the descent was 13 minutes uh, basically and uh, but the last uh, couple of minutes was really uh, exciting we were running out of gas and uh, we had Neil targeted into the wrong area and it's when he pitched over and saw the moon for the first time from an altitude of about 7,000 feet. He said, I can't land here, big boulder field. So he had to level off and fly over this for several miles and then pitch up to slow down and then start down. And that took a lot of extra gas. Mm -hmm. And so now we're minimum fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, the tension emission control got really high and got very quiet. Every, all the controllers, we were glued to our monitors and uh, and uh, it, it real silent in mission control and I and one of the flight controllers said uh, the porcelain guy said 60 seconds so I repeated 60 seconds he had 60 seconds to land then the guy said 30 seconds and I said repeated 30 seconds according to my watch 13 seconds later I heard Buzz Aldrin contact engine stop and we knew they were on the ground and if they had gone past that timer, they wouldn't have been we, able to well, complete the mission? When you say minimum fuel, we really had 4% left. And 4% was to throttle up the uh, max power, start a climb away from the moon, and then abort stage so you have a positive rate of climb. So uh, I'm convinced that uh, had we hit called an abort, it would have been from the spacecraft Say again, Houston, because uh, he's going to land. Mm -hmm. you know, he was 
30 feet away. And so he was going to use that fuel to land. I'm convinced that uh, no matter what we said at Mission Control, if he'd have been 3,000 feet up, he wouldn't try it. But 30 feet, mm -hmm. he's going to attempt it. So When you're in those situations, uh, is, is there like a level of anxiety that you're going through, or is it just kind of like fight or flight? Uh, I would say a little anxiety, but uh, more just tension. Uh, you know, you're so focused on your job and you're so focused on what's going on uh, that you, you you don't really get anxious in the sense of, you know, I'm wringing your hands type anxious. It's uh, You're just so focused and keyed up that you want to make sure you do the right thing and uh, you say the right thing for mission control. And uh, so I, I, it's just a, a tension as the time is, a, as you get closer and closer uh, to the landing. My gosh, I tense up when I do my taxes, let alone <laughs> flying a space shuttle with this kerosene. What, what were some of your favorite memories working on Apollo 11? Well, uh, Apollo 11, uh, the, the memories that I cherish the most was getting to know everybody in Mission Control. And the team that I work with, uh, Gene Krantz, the flight director, and all the flight controllers and uh, the backroom uh, guys and gals who uh, supported the flight uh, crew. And then uh, getting to know, uh, to work with uh, Neil and Buzz and uh, Mike Collins was really very special. To have that opportunity to be asked to do that job was uh, a great honor for me. And so, and, uh, so it was just the personalities mostly that I remember and uh, not so much the uh, tension of getting ready, but uh, but just uh, working with these people and seeing how talented they were. I would think the uh, average age and on the floor of mission control was like 26 or 7. I was uh, 33 at the time. I was the second oldest guy in the room. Wow. And you were at Capcom. What was it like for you working <clears throat> as a Capcom? Well, uh, it, it's a demanding job. I mean, you got to make sure you understand what's going on in the background systems wise. You got to know the spacecraft. You got to know how everything operates. And, uh, and so uh, you train a lot uh, and then work with the crew and the simulations and mission control. We had these simulations and uh, we learned the systems. And uh, so you get to know everybody and, and their strong points. and. Uh, it uh, it works out really well because you're so well trained to, to when you get finally get to that point of you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. You walked on the moon. What yeah. memories do you have from from that? Well, there were, there were several. Uh, mm -hmm. Lift off in the Saturn V was uh, it, very exciting. And, you know, it's a big vehicle, uh, 360 feet tall, and it weighs six and a half million pounds and five engines pushing with seven and a half million pounds and it's shaking like crazy from side to side. And then the first view I had of Earth was about 16, 20,000 miles away as we were on our way to the moon and the spacecraft turned around and there was the Earth moved right into my window out there, just blue and white, and just a jewel. And everywhere else was black. You don't see the stars out in space because the sun always shines. Mm -hmm. There's no night out there. so. Uh, all the way to the moon, you got three days of daylight, and you you look out, and there is the Earth receding and the moon growing. And then the probably the most dynamic part of the landing was, I mean, the flight was the landing on the moon. Uh, our photographs had resolution of 45 feet, so uh, you couldn't see objects smaller than 45 feet. When you pitch over and you start to see the Earth, you you recognize your major land uh, craters. But all these others appear, and you know where they come from. You know, mm -hmm. so you had to maneuver around to find a place to land. John did that, and I talked to him. Like he was my commander. He was actually flying it, and I was talking him down. Mm -hmm. That was my job. Wow. So then the reentry, spectacular. You know, big fireball mm -hmm. as you plunge into the atmosphere at over twenty-six thousand miles an hour, and uh, there was a lot of. In betweens too. I mean, being on the moon was really exciting, of course, and uh, seeing the uh, the um, different terrain unspoiled. You stand, you oh, you're standing there, and you're saying, nobody's ever been here before. You know, it was a real humbling experience, yeah. and uh, 
then to see these different features and all of the different rocks and stuff and the pristine desert. It's probably one of the most beautiful deserts I can imagine. Mostly gray in color, mm -hmm. covered with very fine dust like powder. Mm -hmm. Wow. Scott, what made you want to get on board with this with this project? Uh, I just listened to that story right there, you know, it just, it, it gets me so excited just hearing it. I, as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut, like I think a lot of kids my, my age, and um, I watched every takeoff from, from Mercury to Gemini through Apollo and watched them walk mm -hmm. on the moon. And, so always thought that was something I was going to do, but the time I grew up and didn't didn't work out that way. So being able to to to, to meet Charlie Duke and to be able to be connected to to the space program in this way is just an amazing opportunity. So I'm beyond excited. Um, and the story that he was telling about all the tension as Apollo Eleven came in—that's what we want to try and embrace and try to communicate to audiences that this just wasn't, they didn't just go up to the moon, walk around and come back. It was fraught with danger. Mm -hmm. And these guys are incredibly brave men. I mean, every part of it from the liftoff, you know, to uh, to landing and re-entry and return. It's just a staggering story of bravery and the tension. So our story will try to tell that or show more of that detail uh, that how exciting it actually was. And, and what makes the show so revolutionary? Well, I think it's when you, every show tries to outdo uh, the other by taking different technologies and putting them together at, to create a, an experience for an audience. So I think Apollo was bringing in all these uh, elements and putting them together, but at the same time telling a, a story that's, that's emotional that, that audiences connect, can connect to. And the, the, the story of the grandfather talking to his granddaughter and then her re-entering his or uh, entering his world and and having her eyes open and learning as the story goes along she learns more and more mm -hmm. as we do uh, I think if you you care about her journey and her interest and you care about his journey is he gonna make it on the team is he gonna be a, a player and will he have the right stuff when the time comes mm -hmm. to uh, to do what he's supposed to do in mission control uh, I think that's going to be a very exciting story to tell. You know, I, I think and also uh, when you consider probably well more than half the audience weren't even born when we did it. Yeah. So it's bringing alive an experience that was one of the greatest feats of mankind. So I'm very excited. I can't wait to see it. And, so. and I'd say we, our, our goals are to first entertain um, and what, in doing that we'll educate uh, people about the, the space program and these achievements. Mm -hmm. And then I hope inspire our future astronauts and space explorers and, and get kids excited about the possibility of, of going in, up to the stars. I want to touch on the future for a second. What do the two of you hope for the future of the space program? Well, uh, the administration has just announced the return of the moon and uh, hopefully in the next decade, I believe we'll have people at least orbiting the moon because we got a spacecraft now called Orion which I describe as Apollo on steroids. It's the same shape, but it's uh, bigger, uh, and um, as a new rocket, that and so we can go to the moon orbit and science from orbit. Uh, but we need a lunar module to land, uh, some whatever you call it, a, a lander, and uh, then start building a habitation uh, on the moon, have a permanent science station on the moon. Uh, that's what I see in the future, and uh, and so right now the administration is behind it, and uh, NASA's all for it, and I think we'll eventually, once the space station is uh, uh, ends, comes to the end of its life, most stuff I think will be a private enterprise in Earth orbit, you know, mm -hmm. taking passengers and uh, uh, going into space, uh, either uh, Blue Origin or uh, SpaceX or uh, uh, Virgin Galactic. There's th three or four companies out there ready to ready to go yeah. almost, and so I think we go see more and more people going into orbit and uh, going into space and having that spectacular view of of Earth uh, and the uh, the separation between the blue Earth and then the blackness of space, yeah. and that's a, a, a mind blowing really experience. <laughs> Being able to see that blue and white gem that you described earlier yeah. would just be 
breathtaking. What, what about you, Scott? No, oh, I can't imagine. I mean, I'd like to get on board and go. I'm ready. To, I'm ready to go up there and see it. I mean, it sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But it's happening, mm. and that's the great thing. Yeah. Um, so I hope that this show also sheds a little light on that future prospects and possibilities of space exploration. I think it's going to encourage. Uh, hey, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't. Right now, there's uh, there's a real push uh, uh, to get uh, what I call uh, STEM, uh, is science, technology, engineering, and math. Get the kids uh, in in schools to start studying these subjects because. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very important that we maintain our technological advantage in, in this uh, country and to get the kids interested in that kind of uh, study and those disciplines is very, very important for us and, uh, uh, you know, we, that's what I think, our, and so with this uh, immersive uh, experience, everybody sees this and, you know, man, I'd like to do that. Yeah. And, uh, Maybe not as an astronaut. I got grandkids. Nobody wants to be going to space, but hey, I'd like to build it. I've got one grand, you know, and I don't want to fly it. I want to build it. Yeah, so. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I want everybody out there to get tickets to see this show. It's going to be spectacular. Where can people go to get tickets? Oh, we have a website, uh, Apollo11Show.com. Ticket group tickets are on sale as of uh, today, April second. General public sales start a week from today on the 9th of April. Uh, and we start performances on July 5th uh, in Pasadena on the grounds of the Rose Bowl. We will set up the Lunar Dome, our theater, and it's going to be a magical experience. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on everything, you guys. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. For The Daily Buzz, I'm Howard Henley.